Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the panel meaningfully titled Loss and Damage or Lost and Damaged. Uh, as you are perfectly aware, uh, loss and damage refers to the negative impacts of climate change that occur despite or in absence of mitigation and adaptation. Uh, it can be economic, uh, it can be non-economic, and as you also know, at COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh, uh, there was an event, you know, something happened in Sharm el-Sheikh, everybody is quite, quite uh, happy about it, quite nervous about it also, um, quite anxious about it. Uh, and we'll talk about this anxiety, expectations, and how the future of coping with loss and damage will look like. Uh, let me introduce our panelists today. As you can see, uh, Minister of State for Foreign Affairs and Climate Envoy of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia isn't here today. Um, he had some other uh, issues, urgent issues to take care of. Uh, we have Tina Kubilczyk here, lead negotiator for climate change and head climate policy department uh, at the Ministry of the Environment, Climate and Energy of Slovenia. We have Niels Anen, Parliamentary State Secretary to the Federal Ministry for Economics, Cooperation and Development of the Federal Republic of Germany. And we have Mr. Tadashi Maeda, Chairman of the Board of Di Directors, Japan Banks for International Cooperation. And online, joining us online is Mr. Avinash Perso, Special Envoy to the Prime Minister of Barbados on Investment and Financial Services. Uh, so let's go straight to the Barbados. Uh, as you know, few parts of the planet are as imperiled uh, by the changing, changing climate uh, as the Caribbean islands. Uh, Barbados also, uh, it has been listed globally as one of the most water stress, stressed countries in the world. Uh, you also are, I guess, completely aware of the harsh stance uh, the Prime Minister, Minister of Barbados had in Sharm el-Sheikh, uh, uh, warning of billions of climate refugees, uh, uh, criticizing uh, industrialized nations for failing the developing world on the climate crisis. So my first question to, to Barbados uh, would be, do you think that there's a greater understanding of the climate issues in developing countries? Because it seems that we have developing countries uh, knowing full well that the, the crisis is there, but having less resources to fight back. On the other hand, we have developed countries with, of course, who, the, which are also impacted by climate change, but nevertheless, they have lots of resources to fight back. So that's a great question. Let me uh, begin by saying I'm speaking to you uh, online. I wish I was there. I, I hear it's uh, stunningly beautiful. Um, uh, but I'm here because I'm in Santo Domingo, the capital of the Dominican Republic, where the transition committee is negotiating a loss and damage fund. Uh, we have some 24 negotiators from all over the world. Uh, I'm here representing the Latin American and Caribbean group. And we're negotiating the, the, uh, uh, how we establish and fund uh, this entity. 
So it's a very live topic. Indeed, uh, in order to speak to you this uh, morning here in the Dominican Republic, I am missing the opening session of the negotiation. No, but I did very much want to speak to you because I think you've raised a very important point that let me discuss in just two, uh, two ways. Firstly, um, this issue is very politically charged uh, because um, there's a combination of, of history and geography that really makes things uh, very uh, difficult. So historically, um, the rich countries have contributed the greatest amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And the reason why greenhouse gases matter is they stay in the atmosphere. They don't dis dissipate over time. So about 80% of the stock of greenhouse gases is still there uh, and was put up there by, by rich countries. But the countries that are suffering from the consequences of the climate change that's already here are countries that didn't contribute the 80%. Um, uh, and, but they're suffering uh, considerably. So we've all experienced bad summers and Europe is experiencing a, a hot summer. We, we have the hottest June, the hottest July. Uh, but if you think it's bad, um, the costs uh, for the countries between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn, so that's like 15 degrees on either side of the equator, their costs, their loss and damage is four times greater than where it is anywhere else in the world. That's because sea level, when the glaciers melt, the sea levels grow larger at the equator because that's because of the spin of the earth. And that's also the equators where temperatures uh, are rising to the highest levels. So the cost of loss and damage is high, and we feel that many developed countries don't really appreciate, A, the problem we're experiencing, uh, and, and it's particularly a problem because of, of, of the fact that we didn't cause it. Now, uh, let me end by saying um, what we're trying to do. Um, we need um, mitigation, ultimately, to stop the climate warming. That's the main thing that we need to do. We need to unblock private money to help mitigation because it's a big number. We need adaptation for the climate change that's already here and the climate change is going to happen in the future. We need the develop development banks to lend more to make our countries more uh, adaptable, stronger sea well walls, better flood defenses. But we also need loss and damage for, for things that we haven't had time to adapt ourselves to and we can't adapt ourselves to. And that's a big number. It's $100 billion. The private sector can't get involved. The insurance companies can't get involved. There's no revenue streams. Uh, there's no savings to be had. And so we really need grant-like money that doesn't worsen the debt for these countries. So they already have debt because of climate change. Uh, and so that needs probably new emissions taxes, no one likes taxes. No one likes taxes. And we need international emissions taxes uh, and perhaps carbon credits based on saving those emission taxes by reducing emissions uh, to help fund uh, the loss and damage fund. We need more. Um, Mr. Adden, uh, you are pushing hard uh, to reform the World Bank. Uh, in effort to boost its ability to tackle challenges such as climate change. Uh, how successful are you? <laughs> Thank you uh, for, for having me, and um, it's great to, to have that panel for that important discussion. It's hard to answer your question today, because we are, if you like the expression, we are on the road to Marrakesh, not because Marrakesh is so beautiful, which it is, so you have a tough competition. Um, but um, there we will have a crucial meeting, annual meeting of the World Bank. And we do believe that we made progress. Progress because um, we have been able to present different proposals and we somehow convinced our partners, but also the management of the bank, to accept a little more risk. Um, I don't want to become too technical, you know, we have recommendations that we have been discussing about the capital adequacy framework recommendations. We know step by step starting to implement that and that is opening up resources, additional landing and additional um, space to maneuver. Um, 
But I, I think it's not only because of that discussion that my minister Svenja Schulze, uh, US Secretary um, Yellen and others put forward, but also because what um, um, our friend from Barbados uh, told us here, um, it, I think that the Bridgetown Initiative, um, the most affected countries taking the floor, but also civil society demanding, and rightfully so, especially from the rich countries, to move faster. Um, that is opening up an opportunity, um, but we are not there yet. And my impression from many discussions within the World Bank, but also which is maybe as important as the World Bank itself, the multilateral development banks, is that we need to finance more climate-related projects. We need to think about the entire philosophy of country-based proposals and uh, programs um, to more financing global public goods. But there is very obviously a fear that the rich countries all of a sudden discovering the climate issue, and we are all under budgetary constraints ourselves. So then we're looking at the World Bank, we're looking at the ADB, the IDB, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's only going to work if we make clear that it's not taking a step back from poverty reduction. Because the most affected countries by climate change are usually those who are highly indebted, have a high rate of poverty, and have not contributed to the climate crisis in a significant way. So the dual mandate needs to be renewed, but there is a connection between climate and poverty and the ability of our partners to move forward. And if we don't take that into consideration, then I'm afraid we would not generate the necessary consensus for the World Bank, the MDBs, to fulfill what we believe must be a renewed mandate. Everybody is on the budget. Uh, Mr. Maeda, what should island nations be prioritizing in the international climate space? Well, actually, not just only that Barbados, I'm sorry, just only the Barbados and the Caribbean nations, and many island countries, uh, for example, in the uh, uh, Pacific Oceans. And uh, the, because of the uh, less population of those uh, island countries, allocation of funds by the MDBs uh, quite limited. Therefore, we need some of uh, enhancement uh, of supporting those island countries, not just only the very conventional uh, style of the standard allocation of budget uh, funding uh, from MDBs. We need to, uh, because uh, we need to uh, enhance its capability, not just only MDBs. The MDB plays some pivotal role, but also that's kind of blending financing uh, but more Im importantly, that we invite the uh, private sector's money, not just only the banks, commercial banks, but also that uh, fund providers or asset management companies as well, because they are now ha managing a, a huge amount of money uh, the, in the forms of the uh, funds. For example, that's the uh, company like BlackRock, for example, that the, their funds, their uh, handling is a almost 120% bigger than Japanese GDP, the big amount of money. Therefore, that's a, a, a kind of a, a sort of the, uh, playing, a, playing a, the catalytic role of, of we expected to the uh, MDBs, and also that uh, the developing financial institutions of developed countries like, like our bank, also that in case of Europe, that the European Investment Bank and also the US, US DFC and those DFIs uh, focus together uh, with MDBs to uh, enhance the cap capabilities of the raising fund uh, from many parts of, uh, of the industries. And then that the, uh, this is a critical issue for us to address in, in uh, this issue in a, a new chapter. That's my uh, sense. And uh, uh, private banks, for example, that they already uh, made a commitment under TSFDs, uh, for example, that so-called carbon intensity. Therefore, that's it's any new asset for financed by uh, commercial banks, uh, they already made a commitment to some constraint of the new asset 
to be added, which the, uh, uh, the emit the climate, uh, greenhouse gas. So that uh, uh, they are more uh, focused on the, uh, their financing to the, uh, the assets like uh, renewable energy rather than fossil fuel. That's uh, their own commitment. The, uh, this is a uh, uh, chapter that the, the uh, COP27 just started, therefore that in COP28 uh, in, in Dubai, because that the, uh, the president of uh, COP28, Sultan Jaber, is a, he's a president of ADNOC as well. So that we have been working very closely with ADNOC because uh, the role of uh, that such rich, the oil and gas uh, measures, uh, international, not also the uh, international oil companies, but also that those sovereign-based uh, oil, oil and gas industry uh, made uh, very much the the important role uh, to to bring those funds to this issue. It takes a lot of policies, a lot of negotiation. Uh, the mechanism is here. The fund will be hopefully here soon, but is there still the, the willingness to go through with it? Because it wouldn't happen for the first time that something is agreed on and then we'll have another 10, 20 years waiting to actually fulfill itself. So first of all, um, great being here, being part of this uh, distinguished panel. Um, indeed, you've mentioned the, the international negotiations being a, a complex matter. Um, you know, we hear lots of critiques that the process is being too slow, um, that there is no advancement, um, that we have been way too slow in terms of uh, reacting in this critical de decade, which is, uh, which is um, very fastly approaching um, 2030. Um, we know that we are already at the increase of our global temperature to 1.1, uh, very close to 1.5, um, and that we have to do more. Um, COP27 was indeed, I think, very, very significant when it comes to, um, to loss of damage. Um, I think all the parties at some point when we were approaching the end of this conference um, were, were basically striving towards reaching this deal that would give us, you know, basis to, to work on it in the next couple of months to, to respond to the call, um, to the calls from the most vulnerable. Um, and I think also from the EU side, from, from the Slovenian side, um, we have been um, very vocal in, in, in this term. Um, I think what we have been discussing at COP27 and indeed by the end reaching this agreement on the new funding arrangements and a fund on, on loss and damage uh, is something that now the transitional committee is very hardly uh, working on and, and very good to hear from, from the Dominican Republic from straight from, uh, from, the, from the place to be uh, at the moment. Um, on, on the advancements. Um, I think we're all looking forward uh, towards COP28 in, in Dubai, where I think one of the, um, the main, let's say, um, outcomes that are, um, that are so expected, not only from the, um, from the wider public, but I think also from the parties, and as I said before, from the, from the most vulnerable, um, is in fact to conclude on the on the fund to define how the fund looks like, um, who is contributing to the fund, who is of course uh, getting access to this finance. Um, and um, there will also be a, a ministerial gathering uh, in the context of the, um, of the meetings in New York in September, um, where basically parties are already invited to you know, start announcing the pledges um, so I think uh, we are already at the stage where uh, we are discussing pledges. So um, I would remain optimistic um, and, um, yes, hopeful um, that we can find a, a good solution uh, in order to really contribute to those that are, um, that are really, really, um, that the impact of climate change is, uh, is impacting them um, 
the highest possible extent, basically. Uh, well, everybody could put a number on the economic damage. How can one put a number, uh, and this is the question for Mr. Perso, how can one put a number on uh, non-economic damage? Well, that, that's a great question, and uh, I'm going to answer it in a moment. But let me just briefly, uh, as part of the conversation with your great panel, say, you know, one of our challenges as someone, who, uh, as a country experiencing climate change, um, when we come across well-intentioned people uh, looking to help, is they, they, they offer solutions that don't, won't work. Um, and we sometimes wonder, is that because they, they don't want it to work or they just haven't really had experience? But uh, loss and damage cannot be done by the private sector. The private sector can do mitigation. They can do solar farms, wind turbines. It generates money, so they'll, they'll get involved in that. They're not doing it in poor countries, but um, we need to find ways of de-risking that. But there's no revenues in loss and damage. There's no savings in loss and damage, so they don't get involved. We've tried. We'd love to get them involved. <laughs> the World Bank cannot do loss and damage because the World Bank is a lender. It's a lender that needs to be repaid. The reason why it can lend so well, so cheaply, is because it gets repaid. Um, and if we had to get debt every single time we got hit by a hurricane, and hurricanes are bigger than our islands. Hurricanes are... 200% damage caused by a hurricane, 200% of national income. Not 2%, not 20%, 200%. So if you've got debt every time you got hit by that, you'd be sinking under oceans of debt before the sea levels rise. So we need non-debt ways of funding loss and damage. Um, now, in terms of uh, we can fund economic loss and damage, we have estimates of that. About a month after a disaster hits, the UNDP, the World Bank, and other experts produce a, a really good document called a preliminary loss and damage document. Uh, and that comes up with an economic number. And they're actually pretty good at getting that right. Now, the intangibles and non-economic, it's very hard to put a number to, very hard to value it. My proposal has been, let's assume it is a number. Let's assume it's 10% of economic loss and damage. Because now we need a number. We can't ask people to help provide support for non-economic loss and damage and not give them, give them a number. How can they do that? So we have to start off with a number and then work out, did that number prove to be too high or too low? But I think it's, it's uh, trying to value it. It's going to be very, very hard to do. Uh, so let's start off with something. Uh, and what, what do we mean by non-economic? So people, countries are losing language. They're losing culture. They're losing... Um, uh, losing history. And how do you put a number to that? That's the essence of a country. I don't think it's possible to. But there are ways in which you can think about economic ways of dealing with non-economic problems, uh, building new libraries, uh, dealing with uh, archiving history and culture, and finding new ways of preserving those things uh, and deepening them. That costs money. Uh, and so maybe we should start setting aside 10% of what we put aside for economic loss, for non-economic loss, and then let's have a review and assessment. Did that make a difference? Uh, my next question would be for Mr. Maeda and Mr. Anand. Um, loss and damage uh, was a controversial topic for years um, in the climate negotiations. Uh, would you say that one of the reasons uh, the, loss, the question of loss and damage became so politicized is because it's often tied to compensation. Maybe Mr. Maida first. Yeah, so uh, this is a, a very long-lasting question among the, uh, between uh, developed countries and developing countries. So that's uh, for all the uh, from the viewpoint of the uh, majority of the developed countries, that it is almost equivalent to uh, some compensation what we, uh, our uh, predecessor did, the predecessor's uh, uh, generation did. But uh, the uh, loss and damage caused uh, by uh, uh, climate change and Leo, for Leo problem, for example, that flood uh, here in the Slovenia a month ago, 
uh, was very devastating uh, natural disaster. Uh, this is a uh, because of uh, the uh, kind of accumulated the effect of uh, the, the climate change. It means because of uh, this uh, devastating floods. The same thing in Japan, for example, that uh, this month, uh, the August, there are already three typhoons hit the country. There are a lot of uh, heavy, severe rains and a lot of uh, uh, loss and damage uh, was, it happened. So that the, uh, though this year, the, we are the president of G7, so that we are now, uh, not just only compensation, but also that prevention of natural disasters or not prevention or kind of uh, the uh, uh, protected lives and uh, properties uh, of victims from the uh, damages, for example, from typhoon. Uh, though that we, uh, G7 is now uh, agreed to share that uh, the uh, data of, of uh, meteorological data of the moving the clouds and the typhoons uh, in prior in prior to that actual damage uh, was brought. So that uh, uh, we are more than happy to share those, uh, uh, the meteorological data uh, uh, gathered by uh, satellite, and also that using uh, artificial intelligence to that, to, ex to that uh, 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 kind of uh, the expectation of the movement of this, this uh, typhoons or hurricane and to the possible uh, damage because of this. So that uh, we are uh, 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 supporting those victims to be evacuated, and also that the, uh, to, to minimize this, the, the damage because of this. Because of, of the loss of the lives is very, the most uh, the, uh, critical uh, loss. Property is second, but now the life is more important than, than property. Therefore, that's, this is a very important to, uh, to uh, share those data, uh, of the meteorological data, and immediately uh, the, uh, share this data with many other countries. Uh, that's uh, one issue. This is not the compensation. This is sort of prevention of the more damages because of uh, climate change, uh, because of climate change. And also, um, we need to, uh, we, uh, we, we can use this uh, technology, for example, that uh, in uh, uh, the uh, submarine cables of, of telecommunication. There's some new equipment to detect, that, uh, detect that the vibration of seawater, for example. And then to allow that the uh, the people to ex to uh, evacuate from from those those uh, uh, natural disaster. So this is a uh, the way we discuss in G7. And then uh, this is not just compensation financially, but also that the the uh, some contribution to support uh, those countries as in endangered those uh, natural disaster. Uh, Mr. Anand. Uh how do you see this equation, loss and damage equals compensation? Well, look, I, um, I don't know if we need to um, have a dispute about the question compensation or what frame we are using, but our impression during the last COP, and I think it's fair to say that Germany played a certain role in making um, that loss and damage result possible together with many others, uh, very engaged leadership from the UK and, and, and many like-minded friends. But I think it, it was um, a precondition for building a consensus, a process that is not concluded yet, as we all know. And whether or not you use the term compensation, it's an acknowledgement that the current situation we are dealing with is by and large caused by the Western industrialized countries, but not exclusively anymore. Um, so uh, I think it was the first very crucial step. Also, if you will, a sign that um, 
we are not only talking about mitigation and adaption, which I hope will be in the center of the meeting in Dubai and, and the following meetings, but that the world cannot just move on without looking at the damage done. That is important. Um, well, having said that, sometimes I think we need also to be, in a very honest way, address one aspect that pointing to what historically is an undisputed truth, who bears the um, major share of res responsibility, and I will try to frame it in a very diplomatic way, <laughs> um, cannot be used as an explanation or excuse for some of the um, middle income and virtually very rich countries today not to engage in mitigation and adaption. So the question of the narrative is politically very, very much um, um, uh, important. Um, and we have Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. We have protected crises that we have not paid enough attention in the global south, where sometimes countries who have trouble adapting to the climate effects at the same time have to cope with the consequences of war and, uh, and, and civil conflict. So um, uh, that, that puts us under enormous stress and we should also not forget that not every region in the world came out of COVID so relatively robust and prosperous. Uh, so we, we really need to find a way to build a consensus where that is lacking in so many instances right now. We need more and not less cooperation. While that is unfortunately what we see right now, people are not speaking enough to each other. So uh, I'm perfectly happy to debate, have a debate about a phrase, but I think we should try to find a way also to, to use the platform that is provided to us by UNFCCC and others to have that concrete, also the technical solution-oriented discussion. Otherwise, uh, we will get nowhere and our children will never forgive us. How big of a deal was it, the, the question, the ancient question of compensation during recent negotiations? The question of compensation and, and defining loss and damage itself was already a big part of the discussion when the Paris Agreement was, was, being, uh, was being negotiated. So I think back in, in Sharm el-Sheikh, we have indeed focused on loss and damage in terms of um, averting, minimizing, and addressing loss and damage. Um, so indeed, as, as already mentioned, that was a part where, well, where you can mitigate um, the, the climate change, you can adapt to climate change, and then you also have this notion of, um, of addressing the loss and damage that we are already seeing worldwide, as also already mentioned. Um, the fact is that, for example, what we have been experiencing in Slovenia very recently with the, with the, with the effects of floods, um, these, these are, this is loss and damage in, 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 in in, in real life, and this is what, what has been happening to us. Um, but of course, the situation in Slovenia is, is very different to a small island nation um, um, country where the effects are tremendous in when it comes to, to financial consequences. And I think what, what we really need in the next couple of months when we are approaching towards Dubai, and especially in Dubai, we do need to restore the trust between the, let's say, this developing part of the world and developed part. And this is, and this is always something that is, it's obviously crucial in the negotiations, but I think um, at this stage we are, let's say, somehow lost a bit in, in, in this process when it comes, I think, um, in terms of building trust, uh, also because of, of, of different uh, crises that is happening uh, in the world apart from um, the, the crisis of, of climate change. Um, what we also need and what we have been seeing very clearly um, in Slovenia uh, in the past couple of weeks is the, is the solidarity. 
Um, I think uh, we need to we need to be very very aware, um, and and we do also as developed uh, nations have to uh, have to act accordingly. We do have the 100 billion goal um, um, that has been uh, negotiated some time ago and uh, hasn't been yet reached. Um, I think we are, um, as the numbers show, on, on a very good path uh, towards, uh, towards reaching this goal. Uh, but not only that, we are also discussing a new financial goal, which is going to be much bigger in scale, I think also much wider. Um, that the process will, will only finish uh, next year, but I think when it comes to finance, so not only loss and damage per se, but also wider, um, let's say, not only the mosaic of solutions that we are trying to find for loss and damage, but, but also wider, wider discussion on, on, on finance, um, it will play a crucial role in, in the next year and a half, for sure. Uh, I can be a fortune teller, because I know that the following panel is, will be delayed slightly because there's a huge interest already from <laughs> members of the public to pose questions. So I will uh, give you the, the possibility to ask now. And there, yeah, I, I could sense the, the eagerness. Hello. Thank you. Uh, I'm Tommy Huhtanen. I'm, I'm executive director of uh, uh, Wilfred Martin Center for European Studies, which is the think tank of the European People's Party. I would uh, jump in what the panelists said about the narrative, in trying to formulate in a diplomatic way. And I, and I uh, indeed, what I understood uh, that the question was a little bit there is that how much this uh, you know nar current narrative is helping really to resolve the challenge which we all agree. That is to say that this division, which is now also played here in the panel, uh, between uh, so-called developed countries and developing countries, when, when the, actually the facts are also starting to change. Concrete example. For example, uh, China, historically, if you take all the emission data from 1850 until now, in three years, China uh, in 2026, China has contributed more to the climate change than Europe, 27 countries. So what I'm saying that it's not so, uh, you know, black and white. And 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 then this are you know so-called narrative argument has been is being used not to really resolve always the, in my view, the the problem at hand, but for other political. Uh, motives. For example, yesterday, you know, our Chinese friend put the issue on the table in the, his opening statement. So my question there, indeed, that, that should we, you know, is this dichotomy developing versus developed, is it really helpful in terms of resolving the problem? The question was for, for whom? Uh, for the panel. Oh, for the panel. I, yeah. I'm happy to. <laughs> I'm happy to have a go at that. Uh, it's a uh, it's a, it is a, these are issues that um, shadow our discussions immensely. Um, and then there, no, there are no easy answers. Um, uh, uh, the, the developing countries today are the biggest emitters. As a group, they are 63% of global emissions. Um, of course, you've got to take population into account. China is a big emitter today, but its population of 1.4 billion people is considerably greater than in Europe. And you, if you look at uh, emissions per head of the population, uh, it is uh, in a very different picture. And I don't think you can ignore that dynamic. Um, the rich countries contributed 79% of past emissions, but we also have to remember that's how they got rich. So they're in a position of wealth because of that. Now imagine what Germany and Japan would be like without industrialization. Um, and so uh, that's why they do have this extra responsibility. But that extra responsibility uh, cannot mean that developing countries cannot or should not play a major role because of where emissions are today. And the numbers are even more horrifying if you look at where new discoveries and production is taking place. Um, and uh, so we need to find a solution that poor countries do not feel that the way to their leveling up is through 
uh, massive use of fossil fuels. And that's why we need to do mitigation, we need to do adaptation, and we need to do loss of damage. But uh, the, the Bridgetown Initiative is about the way we can actually achieve that, n- recognizing that rich countries have fiscal type positions. No, they, they're not getting elected to send billions of dollars to poor countries. Their aid budgets are, are pretty packed and, uh, if anything, falling in terms of, of new aid uh, to, to this area. So that's why we say mitigation, we need to get the private sector involved. They're not going to developing countries. So we need a way of unblocking their flow to developing countries. And rich countries can play a role in unblocking the flow of private money. So they don't need to do a lot, but it could have a big impact on the climate. And with adaptation, well, rich countries have the majority, because of historical reasons, on the multilateral development bank boards. They don't need to do a lot to leverage their capital to make to allow lots of, of lending into adaptation. So that's the way the rich countries can use their historic responsibilities to help move the needle to get developing countries onto the green transformation. Yeah, thank you um, for the question. I, I want to, because I basically agree with, uh, with what my friend from Barbados said, and, and we already talked a little bit about World Bank reform um, and the MDB reform, so we really need to focus on that, and I, I expect also the pressure adding up a little bit when the um, annual meeting in Marrakesh is going to take place. But I want to maybe um, mention an additional aspect of what is ahead of us. Um, if you look at my country, Germany, yeah, we have been extremely you know, impacted by Russia's war of aggression because I think everybody knows that Germany was uh, quite a big consumer of Russian natural gas and oil, but especially natural gas. So, We had to compensate that, and and we did that. And there's a lot of discussion about, you know, Germany now using more fossil fuels. That's a fact, and there was no other way around to solve the situation. But we used that crisis also to accelerate our path, our roadmap, if you will, to become CO2 neutral. And, And that's the, I think, decisive point doing that by maintaining our solid industrial base. And we are democracies. If our people at home are afraid about their government's climate change approach, we will lose public support. If our discourse is one of, um, well, historically, we have been wasting so many resources, which is true, and so now we, you know, we have to take a step back and probably we will have to cut our own wealth and prosperity. That's not going to work in democracy. So I think we need to take that point in our electorate very seriously. Investing in climate change doesn't mean less wealth and prosperity. It's the precondition for maintaining and spreading wealth and prosperity. And if you allow me, Mr. Chair, just one aspect. We are right now, because of the industrial base of the developed countries, we are right now creating a global market for green hydrogen. And there are developing countries that come into play in a new way into that global market. And from a development point of view, And that's the German policy. We need to make sure we have our own interest, and we should admit that. We need to import hydrogen in the future. But we have a a huge opportunity to create jobs and know-how and infrastructure and stabilization of energy markets in our partner countries, in the developing countries. But whether or not we succeed with that, or if we just replicate the old Um, I would say, post-colonial structure in in global uh, markets. That's a decision that politicians of my generation have to take. And that's a a decision that we we can influence. And so I I think that, you know, there, there is a lot also in terms of technological innovation that can help us achieve that, maintain our prosperity and spread prosperity otherwise 
we will lose the, um, the public opinion battle. And there are many rich countries where climate change is denied by former major serious parties with aspiration to maybe becoming governing parties again, which is quite shocking, if I may say so. That was another question, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Eva Tomic. I'm coming uh, from here, uh, Slovenia. And I would like to comment well on the loss and damage. I would say, um, I would say it's a mistake to view it only in the compensation way. And I think the compensation will mostly be adjudicated by different courts. And such legal proceedings have already started. My country included is being sued at the European Court of Human Rights by young Portuguese activists. Six of them. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and this will, I think, you know, there will be more and more of such lawsuits. But for me, the loss and damage is particularly part of the climate justice, I think, that's what we are trying to do. And I'm not trying to oppose the loss and damage, but my problem with it is that it really is part of an equation and we haven't yet determined the other variables of this equation. We haven't reached an agreement on, on reversing the CO2 emissions into uh, the air, um, and you know we are observing this uh, this uh, paradox that while the renewable uh, clean energy is uh, on the rise in record numbers, however the emissions are still on the rise, and it seems only the growth, the growth, the new growth, is eating up the clean energy part. So we really need to be uh, quick, quicker um, than I, the COP. The COP needs to quicken up, in my modest opinion. And we need to be innovative. But I also wanted to, to challenge an assumption that this is a developed world versus the developing world. I think um, this narrative is not particularly helpful because, in fact, it's the biggest polluters, the 20 biggest polluters, against all the rest, isn't it? So, since I'm coming from Slovenia, and my country used to be some way back in history, part of the, uh, well, as Yugoslavia then, part of non-aligned movement, so I will play devil's advocate here and ask myself, isn't it time perhaps for a new climate non-aligned movement to pressure the biggest polluters to step it up really? Not with pollutions, of course. So <laughs> uh, that was my thinking. And then I was going to ask um, Barbados on the Bridgetown Initiative, um, and particularly um, he mentioned um, taxing uh, fossil tax, which I think is, uh, yes, international emissions tax, which I think we need to start thinking in innovative financing ways because there is not enough money in uh, state aid and um, I mean public money can help to some way to unlock private investments but it won't be enough if we are talking about uh, really um, adaptation measures needed and um, 
mitigation as well. Uh, so I, I'd be really grateful to hear more on how these international mission stacks might work. Thank you. Thank you. If I could uh, respond to that, uh, we are trying to uh, reformulate the traditional boundaries. Um, we, we know that we do not consider uh, ourselves just talking about small island states, for example, um, but all climate vulnerable countries, which is a large group of countries. It's, it's about 40% um, of the world's population, 3.2 billion people, and growing, sadly, because we're not doing enough on mitigation. And let, let, let's, I, I hope not, but uh, your countries will become climate vulnerable if we do not act uh, further in the same way uh, that this group are. But, and, and yes, we need to look at the uh, developing countries that are big emitters and not just think about developed versus developing. And India, Brazil, uh, China, Indonesia, Mexico are major emitters. But the reason why the fault line of developing and developed matters, is the numbers are so big that for mitigation, we have to get the private sector involved. The cost of capital of investing in these projects is divided along the lines of developed and developing. The cost of capital of a solar farm project in Japan and Germany is around 4%. The cost of the exact same project with the exact same technology in South Africa is 14%. In, uh, in other countries in Africa, it's even greater. And that's why the private sector is not going there. So if we want to engage the developing countries, which we have to, we have to find ways of unblocking the flow of private capital to developing countries. Private capital is going to develop countries. Uh, we're seeing a lot of mitigation being funded by the private sector. It's not happening in developing countries. We believe the biggest obstacle is, in fact, foreign exchange risk. Uh, and we are hoping to push for a launch at COP, uh, a new foreign exchange guarantee mechanism that will guarantee some of these FX risks and unblock private capital flow into the, develop the developing big emitters. Well, uh, most of the countries already made a commitment to carbon neutrality by 2050. But uh, the G7, for example, that G7 is now engaged with uh, many developing countries uh, in terms of uh, energy transition because uh, it's a carbon neutrality is a uh, the, is a not short terms the uh, goal. This is a uh, goal we might be uh, 2050. So we need to uh, draw some uh, picture for the roadmap towards the carbon neutrality. And they, uh, this, uh, through this engagement, for example, G7 targeted two countries as an example. One is Vietnam, two is Indonesia. This uh, uh, we call JetP, uh, uh, with a, uh, with a, uh, with a uh, friends in Germany, for example. And uh, we found that those countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, do not want to sacrifice economic growth. Therefore, that uh, uh, they need a uh, funding from outside, outsource, outside the financing source. Therefore, that we, they need uh, the finance uh, up to 2050. So that uh, it's not just only that uh, issue on this year, but the uh, t uh, about 30 years to come. So we need to draw so the uh, uh, relevant the roadmap to carbon neutrality. So that uh, we now recognize that uh, uh, our law, about our G7, as a the, uh, group of, of developed countries. The same time that uh, uh, the venue for COP, COP28, venue for the World Bank meeting, so many, uh, it's a uh, slightly different manner, but uh, the goal is, a, is, a, is the same. Carbon neutrality. The European Union is now uh, uh, creating a uh, board adjustment, use uh, introduction of a kind of, of a carbon pricing. We are following this. That the carbon pricing is very important, so that uh, this is not to penalize the emitter, but some of the create some of the mechanism to uh, uh, bring some fund from uh, from those in, those those countries. 
And uh, this is, will contribute to the shift of the funds from developed countries to developing countries uh, in, in the forms of uh, uh, the carbon pricing. So th that's, uh, uh, we are now embarking on these uh, steps already. And they, uh, also we need to have some of a verification mechanism because the uh, electric vehicles will not the emit greenhouse gas during uh, driving by driving. However, that's if you use the uh, manufacturing stage, if they uh, use that fossil fuel to manufacture the EV is not the, the green. So that we need to have verification mechanism of a life cycle assessment so that we have to uh, agree among the all, all participants, not just only developed countries, but also developing countries, because different countries do not want to sacrifice economic growth. So that this is a very uh, challenging task, but don't it task. However, that the, uh, we, we need to engage uh, one by one, country by country, because the country, the country, each country has a different situation. So this is not uh, no quickly cut a solution. So we, we need to engage. It's, uh, we are more than happy to engage with Barbados, for example. That's uh, uh, because we are, uh, we are uh, in line with your countries. So that's my, uh, my uh, the tentative answer at this moment. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'd actually like to respond first to this uh, developing developed uh, notion and, and um, I think many, um, I've been hearing lots of voices um, saying that, you know, it's an old system from, from 1992 uh, which is outdated, uh, we, we should have a different, um, we should have uh, some, some sort of different variation of, of, of those notions when it comes to one set of countries and, and the other. Um, I think it's important to, to, to have in mind that when it comes to, to loss and damage in particular, um, and also when establishing the new fund, um, we know that the public money will not be enough. We know that the, 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 the funds that will come from, the, from developed countries as, um, as, as, as being established in the, in the UNFCCC convention and then on, in, in Kyoto and, and in Paris, um, will not be sufficient, and I think what we do have to look at is that indeed we mobilize the private funds, but then again to set the funds to those that really need it. And I think that the first condition when it comes to the, to the fund should be that it is indeed for the most vulnerable, and then secondly, who pays into this fund, I think it should not be the question of develop developing, but I think this this notion should be somehow wider. How, how, to, how to formulate it, um, I think it's something, it's a task for the transitional committee perhaps, uh, and I'm pretty sure there will be some, some ideas coming from there. Um, but I think on, on this side of the needs, I think it's also important that the countries perhaps uh, start to include some sort of loss and damage analysis or assessments um, in their national climate plans. You know, to, to sort of to, to, to try to, um, to see what exactly might be the needs to, to look into the infrastructure when, when a disaster happens, um, to, to quantify this, um, at least this, um, let's say, economic losses that, that, we've, that we have been mentioning at the, at the beginning of our panel. Um, so in order to be better prepared, um, but also to to sort of already to signal to, to, um, to investors, to, to, you know, to those that, that actually can contribute with funds, uh, where would be those funds needed the most. And then secondly, when I'm already discussing or already mentioning the, the national plans, um, I think the, the nature of the Paris Agreement, when, which, which basically says that every country sets its own target and it's, it's national determined contribution, which is basically what counts in terms of what sort of emissions you're going to cut, um, how are you gonna do so and so on. This is the core of the Paris Agreement. And I think what's going to be really important at this year's COP as well is that we're gonna have for the first time the global stock take. We're gonna see where exactly 
where we are, what we have done in terms of mitigation, in terms of adaptation, in terms of finance. And I think good outcome on, on when it comes to the, to the global stock take itself could bring us then perhaps a step further and, and could uh, give us a, a sort of a, a roadmap um, for renewing our vows in terms of the, the national determined contributions um, and hopefully raise the ambition that we, that we much need. Thanks. Thank you. I, um, I just wanted to add one, one aspect because my colleague here mentioned the carbon border adjustment mechanisms. And I, you know, I, I share your view that's uh, a necessary tool that we have to implement also to protect um, the idea of, of, of fair conditions for doing business and production. But we know that um, this is seen with certain skepticism around the globe. And we are already entering, you know, in major countries taking protectionist measures. Um, and that it's economically but also politically based, those decisions. Um, and it's having an effect on, on prosperity and growth <laughs> prospects. So that's why um, Chancellor Scholz launched that idea of a climate club, to have an inclusive discussion and to address also the different mechanisms that in different parts of the world right now are being discussed or implemented when it comes to climate border adjustment mechanism as one aspect um, to have an understanding and, if possible, an agreement and to avoid that protectionist um, fears that we see uh, especially among um, our partner countries in the developing world. We have less than 10 minutes till the end of this uh, panel, so if anybody has... Yeah, of course. Thank you. <clears throat> Is it on? Uh, Johan Schaar from uh, Stockholm International Peace Research Institute in <clears throat> in, in Sweden. So um, our, our Bosnia, our, our Slovenian colleague, touched upon this other very difficult issue of what kind of criteria or mechanism will be used to trigger release of funds uh, from a loss and damage fund. And of course, one can think in terms of assess the historic uh, loss and damage that can be attributed to climate change uh, and one can uh, think in terms of, of uh, um, anticipatory action that will allow <clears throat> uh, adaptive capacity to be built. So my question is how, how far has the transition committee advanced in, in discussing this other difficult issue? The um, developing country group feels that this is not a difficult issue. Um, if the scope of the fund is about dealing with actual loss and damage that's taken place. You might have a trigger mechanism as based on a percent of your national income that's a, that has been lost. Um, there are two types of, of climate disasters, and that's one of the challenges. We have the, uh, what is called extreme weather events, like hurricanes, where within a month or so, we're quite good at estimating what the loss and damage is. Um, and so that trigger mechanism can be used. We already have regional risk pooling for which people are making that assessment uh, already. The challenge is for slow onset uh, disaster because, and indeed, this is actually the biggest problem. It's, it's sea level increasing by a, a couple inches every year that's causing uh, damage. So the trigger has to include a, a cumulative dimension of loss and damage, as well as a, a uh, immediate dimension. But if you do that, and it's based on those two things, um, and countries eligible are countries that maybe have national adaptation plans as well in place, uh, as, as my colleague from Slovenia said, uh, then I think that that makes a, a lot of, I think that makes the eligibility issue um, solvable. Any other questions? No. Um, 
let's be, we, we were talking, the, the climate justice was mentioned. Um, let's be unrealistically optimistic and move into the future. Loss and damage fund is there. The pledges are there. The funds are there. The money is there. Uh, there's always not enough money and always lots, lots and lots of problems. And now the, the trillion dollar question. Who should get priority? Uh, countries uh, 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 battered by sea level rising, uh, other countries, how should we determine, let's say, who goes first? <laughs> Nobody wants to answer this question now. <laughs> okay, I volunteer. I, I, I'm happy to answer it. I, I feel I've been doing too much of the talking, though. So, uh, I mean, we, we think of this as our negotiating position, that it's based on uh, loss and damage, um, that the size, uh, the percent of that. Now, we also would need to cap uh, the amount so that the fund uh, is not um, diminished by one e one large event. So we would say that maybe one uh, beneficiary could not could not get more than seven, eight, nine, ten percent of the fund. The amount that they receive would again be a function of the size of their loss and damage, maybe up to half of the the, the estimate of loss and damage, as long as it was no lo not greater than 10% of the fund. And that would be the way that you would uh, have to address it. So I think that the issue is not, the distinction being made is, is this a fund to deal with actual loss and damage, which needs to be funded by non-debt sources, as opposed to, uh, I think that even for the much thornier area is not so much that, because we'd have the loss and damage. We'd see it. The thornier area is concessional lending for climate adaptation, because this is about uh, investing in countries that have not yet had the disaster, and you're trying to build resilience, and you're trying to use concessional money, which is not zero cost. Concessional money is costing somebody something. So there's a limit to the amount of concessional money. How do you allocate concessional money for adaptation? And we need some measure of the probability and likelihood these countries will have a significant loss and damage by some future event. Mr. Anand, you, you, you started laughing. Yeah, no, no, I mean, um, for, for us, if you look at what, what our government has been doing over the last years, we have been um, investing, not, I mean, conceptual, in, in a conceptual way, but also in terms of funding. We invested, I would say, roughly a billion um, in uh, climate uh, disaster mitigation uh, insurance and what we call the uh, a global shield. That is um, taking a little bit that idea that uh, our friend from Barbados just discussed to, to, um, and to use anticipatory action uh, to prepare and to look for a way um, where when disaster hits, the international community then can provide with a hopefully standardized way pre-arranged um, funding. So that's, I think, one important aspect. But the question that you ask to answer that in an international conference is probably not doing you any good because we saw even in, you know, countries in the north and, and the, our wonderful host country here that everybody can be affected. So. Um, I think we need to focus on the most vulnerable. That's why we are working with the vulnerable 20, that, that group together. Um, I think the small island development states have been mentioned. That's very obvious for me, that we, we need to find an immediate solution. But consensus requires that everybody understands that he or she has to contribute, but there's also something in for me. That's how the entire business is going to work. So I think. Um, we, we need to broaden the consensus, uh, and we have to have that um, negotiation in the upcoming 
COP. Um, and if I look at how private sector, and we're not sufficiently mobilize them yet, that's true. And that's something to be discussed with the World Bank and the MDBs. But if you look how, and I think my Japanese colleague mentioned that, if you look how private sector is investing, that's the reason for optimism. So uh, I, I think it's very late, but it's not too late, and we need to use that existing dynamic. So because our time is running out, we are optimistically waiting for COP28 uh, with high hopes and hopefully next year we'll have a concrete fund, concrete pledges and we'll do the rest of the questions I've prepared for this panel. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much.